Good morning, I'm Pastor Brett, the discipleship pastor at Eagle Creek Church. As you just heard, Pastor Matt um, has been on an epic hike with his son, and I'm so happy for those guys. So I get to be with you this morning, and I'm excited about sharing some powerful truths from God's Word. Good morning to our Warrensburg campus, and those of you watching online, we're so glad you get to be with us. Um, I am one of the newer staff members at Eagle Creek Church. I started my responsibilities last September after a couple decades of serving in Africa with my wife, Joan. In fact, at this time last year, we were still serving in North Africa. Uh, way back in the late 90s is when we started our journey in Africa. My oldest son was born there in South Africa. Then we were back in the States for a few years getting more education, a little bit more ministry experience. Then we relaunched as a family, went to, uh, to language school in France, then a few years in Central Africa, eventually more years in East Africa, and roughly the last eight years in Northern Africa. I've been married to my beautiful wife, Joan, almost 30 years. It'll be 30 years in December. We have four young adult children, two boys, two girls, 19, 20, 21, and 24. Uh, we love them dearly, and uh, we thank God for them daily. I love the series that Pastor Matt has been preaching through Dinner with Jesus. I love it. So many wonderful things happen around the table. So many wonderful memories made. Um, I am a farm boy from North Dakota. Uh, grew up there in a really wonderful Christian family. Thank God for my heritage, for my mom and dad. And I have a lot of memories of going to uh, Grandma Botnan's house. This is my mom's mom. She was a full-blooded Norwegian, full of energy and life and feisty, and she loved her heritage. She was an active member of the Sons of Norway. How many of you know Sons of Norway? Okay, if you're Norwegian, not, not a hand. So in North Dakota and Minnesota, it's kind of a big deal. Um, so uh, in, the, in the holidays, certain Norwegian foods still had priority. The two most famous ones were lutefisk and lefse. And you say, wow, I've never heard of those. How many of you have heard of lutefisk or lefse? Okay, there we go. So um, lefse is like a potato tortilla. And when you roll it up and put a little sugar and cinnamon in it, it is delicious. And my wife learned to make lefse from my grandma and was later given my grandma's lefse maker. So this tradition has lived on in our household for which I am so happy. Lutefisk, it's like a dried cod that is um, soaked in lye. And you say, that doesn't sound very good. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> grandma, forgive me. <laughs> So we don't eat uh, lutefisk in my household anymore. In today's story, I'm pretty sure that Martha was not making lefse, but she was making wonderful memories with Jesus, her Lord and Savior. And we are lucky this morning because this little story has been preserved for us in really uh, good detail. And it has some great lessons for each of us today. So this is the story of Jesus visiting Martha and Mary in Luke chapter 10. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Who exactly were Martha and Mary? Well, they were beloved disciples of Jesus. He knew them and their brother Lazarus very well. We learned about them last week in the story of Jesus being anointed at Bethany. Now, today's well-known story, many of you have heard it, know it, you've heard it preached many times. This is not about domestic housework. It is rather a story of discipleship. 
And it's not really about the contrast between active and meditative style of spirituality, because both are important and necessary in real life. My mom stated recently in response to this story, I was at her house last weekend, and she said, well, people need to eat. And she's right, think about it. Without action, we wouldn't eat. And without reflection and meditation, we wouldn't worship. This is a story about discipleship and Jesus' boundary-breaking lesson on who can be a devoted follower. Since I am the discipleship pastor here, I get frequent questions about discipleship. One of the main ones is, what is discipleship? Most simply, it is being with Jesus. It is listening to Jesus and then it is obeying Jesus, which is always best accomplished in community. We grow best together, which is why I am a big fan, fan of community groups. We're relaunching the summer session next week. If you've never been a part of a community group, I encourage you to sign up because you will grow. You will grow together. If you can't do it this summer, please sign up in September when we relaunch community groups. And a quick note from the biblical perspective on discipleship is that it is never optional. Occasionally there's this idea that I can call myself a Christian, oh, and that discipleship thing, which is daily really listening and hearing from Jesus and pursuing him, that's a little bit optional. But it's not. It's the daily path of following Jesus with all of our heart, always learning, becoming the person that God created us to be. It is a daily relationship with Jesus, daily, active, and vibrant. So the first uh, point this morning is that disciples are loved by Jesus. If you're saying, wow, that seems really simple. It is, and it's true. The extent to which you receive and embrace the forgiveness and love of God is the extent to which you can love and forgive others. I'm going to say it again because this is so important in our Christian walk. The extent to which you receive and embrace the love of God for yourself is the extent to which you can love and forgive others. Meaning, if you have trouble receiving the grace and forgiveness of God for yourself, you will have trouble extending that to others. It is vital that you understand how deeply God loves you. When you receive his forgiveness in full, you are a new creation with new priorities and a whole new outlook on life. And when you really know that you are loved and accepted by God, you are free to love others extravagantly, not because they deserve it, but because God's unconditional love is flowing through you. It's a beautiful and almost mysterious process, but it's real and it's life transformative. Jesus dearly loved this family, Martha, Mary, Lazarus. Let's take a quick look at John 11, which I believe in all the Bible gives us the clearest picture of Jesus' special relationship with this family. John chapter 11. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for two more days. Jesus loved Martha and Mary. He knows his followers, and he is for them. And Jesus loves us, each and every one of us, with a perfect love, which is so different than human love. The love of Jesus is for the long haul. Jesus sees your life situations perfectly, Yesterday, today, forever. We have a limited perspective. He does not. It's interesting and a little perplexing to me in this John 11 story. If I were scripting how things were happening, the sisters send word. They, uh, Jesus finds out that Lazarus is sick. And he books it. 
to Bethany really fast and he heals Lazarus and everybody is relieved and happy. But if that happened, we wouldn't have one of the most powerful chapters in all of the Bible where Jesus stands before Martha and he says, I am the resurrection and the life, which is him giving a little hint to what's about happening in his own life. So we see how much Jesus loves this family. And Jesus sees you. He sees his disciples. He's for you. He has your back. When you face adversity or failure, go to him. Sometimes when we mess up, the human response, what do we do? We might stop going to church. We hide away. We run away. We run from Jesus in our shame. But the right thing to do that always the right thing to do is in our disappointments, in our failures, we run to Jesus. He stands ready to help you, and his love for you is unconditional, meaning that you cannot lose his love. You cannot lose the love of God, even when you mess up. So disciples embrace God's love for them, and this changes their entire outlook and their attitude. The second point is that disciples see and they listen to Jesus. So a couple weeks ago, I decided to get my eyes checked because I've been living in Africa for a long time. Those kind of things tend to slip between the cracks. It's not as simple there. I don't know. You know what, why do we not get our eyes checked? We need to see clearly, right? So I had you ask me a couple weeks ago, hey, Pastor Brett, um, do you think that there will be any change in your prescription? Are you seeing clearly? I would say, yes, I'm seeing 100% clearly. And my response to you would have been sincere and genuine. There's no problem. It's just at this stage of life, it's probably a good idea to let them do the puff in my eye and all the things that they do. And they kind of look into your soul. And then they, you know, you, they talk about your, your eyes and so on. So I did it. I sat down and they puffed into the eye and... The guy was, he was very talkative, and he looked into my soul, and apparently that was okay. And then, and then he was doing the things they do with the dial. He goes, oh, by the way, this is your old prescription. And I remember looking, and I said, that's blurry. He said, yeah, things have changed a little bit. And this is a little bit scary. We can call ourselves a Christian, little by little, incrementally, be moving away from the heart of the Father if we're not seeing Jesus, if we're not listening to Jesus, if we're not spending time with Jesus. So when a person falls in their faith, it never happens in a moment in, to in time. It happens little by little over much time. In the same way, the people that we love and admire as giants in the faith who are solid and strong and have faced so much adversity and now have become great men and women of God, that too, has happened incrementally, a day at a time, a moment at a time, under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So as we draw near to Jesus and sit at his feet as a devoted disciple, listening carefully, putting things into daily practice, and teaching others through our lifestyle and words, we become more aligned with the heart of the Father. I don't know any other pathway to being close to the heart of the Father is seeing, listening, and learning from Jesus. We begin to see what he sees. We begin to hear what he hears, and we begin to take on his values and priorities, which are so different from those of the culture that we live in. Being aligned with God and his higher purposes is the life of discipleship. On the other hand, if we stubbornly keep our own, our old prescription, thinking that we see things clearly, but kind of doing things on our own, not listening to Jesus, not putting daily things into practice, not making disciples, we can easily become distant from the heart of the Father. And what happens? We no longer see what he sees. We no longer hear what he hears. And we find it increasingly difficult to take on God's values and priorities. 
we are then easily influenced by the world and its values, which stand in opposition to those of the Father. What was Mary's choice? Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. People often see what they wish to see. In this story, Mary saw Jesus, and she was fully present to him and this wonderful opportunity to listen to him. She had eyes to see and ears to hear. She was a model disciple, teachable, humble, and very attentive. Jesus, a revolutionary for God and his kingdom, was always redrawing the boundaries. What's the real problem in this story? The real problem was that Mary was behaving as if she were a man. And that culture, and in many cultures still today, some of which I have lived in, male and female roles were very strictly demarcated. For a woman to settle down comfortably among the men in a home like this was bordering on the scandalous. Who did Mary think she was? Who did she think she was? Theologian N.T. Wright explains that to sit at the feet of a teacher was a decidedly male role. This wasn't so much an adoring posture like a little puppy looking up to his master, but rather a person wanting to learn from the master, wanting to hear new things and putting it together in their mind. So to sit at someone's feet meant they were the teacher and you were the learner or the disciple. And to sit at the feet of a rabbi or a teacher was what you did if you wanted to be a teacher yourself. In this story, Mary has quietly taken her place as a would-be teacher of the kingdom of God. So my question to you this morning, do you deliberately sit at Jesus' feet as often as possible and saying, God, fill me with your truth. Fill me with your life. Fill me with your presence so that I, too, can teach others about the abundant life in the kingdom of God. And how does Jesus respond to her audacious behavior? Jesus affirms her right to do so. And some of you are saying, you don't know my brokenness. You don't know my mistakes. You don't know my trouble troubles. And Jesus is saying, I don't care. When you come to me, all things are made new. The old has gone and the new has come. And I will teach you about life in my kingdom. This is a story about the boundary breaking call of Jesus Christ and about who is to be included among the disciples. You see, the more closely we walk with Jesus, seeing him, listening to him, the more clarity we gain about the kingdom of God. Our misunderstandings give way to God's higher purposes, and our preconceived ideas are stripped away. Our thoughts and our motives become aligned with God's, God's, and our hearts become more like his. When we sit at Jesus' feet, this affects everything in our daily lives, how we do business, how we spend our time, how we relate to one another within our families, how we treat our spouses, and how we perceive people and cultures that we do not understand. About 18 years ago, my wife and I were ready to go to France for language school. We had four young kids, and we had been warned about a few well-intentioned people that uh, the people in France, they don't like Americans so much. And so... We, we were told, hey, be ready for some mistreatment. So this was a little bit unfortunate so, because for me then, I arrived um, a little bit overly cautious and a little bit prejudiced in my heart. And so early on in our time in France, we were there studying French that we would have to use in Africa. I made my infamous proclamation to Joan about why we were there. It went something like this. We're simply here to learn the French language. And when we're done with that, we're on our way. No emotional attachment, just a brief stop on the road to Africa. What a misguided statement. How short-sighted, how wrong I was. However, over time, 
I developed a relationship, a close friendship with the French believer. And my family received so much kindness and love and support from many French families. And I realized the huge benefits of living in Albertville, the small French city surrounded by the Alps. So my first few months in France, I was not seeing things clearly at all. Not from God's perspective, not God's greater purposes, not the beauty of the French Alps, not the friendship and kindness being offered by the French people, not the warmth and affection we received at the little church that we attended. I had so much to learn, and the French language had little to do with it. God wanted to teach me life lessons, deep lessons that had so much more to do than any language but I had to open my eyes and my heart to understand his higher purposes. God has a higher purpose for each of your lives as well. But it demands that we slow down, sit at the feet of Jesus, and really see and hear. One thing is for sure, for everyone in this room today, when you walk closely with Jesus, your prejudices will fall away little by little you will see people as being made in the very image of God, even those you disagree with, even though you do not understand. God will redraw your boundaries and soften your heart. This happened to me in North, North Africa not that many years ago. God spoke to me in a small, still voice. It was very clear. Hey, I want you to see each and every one of these people is bearing my image. I thought, I can do that. I have to walk a lot. People are everywhere on the streets. I have lots of opportunity to do it. So I, I began walking, and not everybody, but when the Spirit impressed it on my heart, I would stop and look at them for a second and say, that is somebody who has a name, and they are made in God's image. And when I would go to work in the morning and I would turn the, the corner and I'd go down the hill on the street called Drodeb to the language school that my wife and I ran, a lot of time there were some old men kind of huddled at a coffee shop or maybe even sitting on the sidewalk wearing their jalaba, the long robe. And I would look at the, the older man and say, that is somebody made in God's image. He has a name and God loves him very much. This simple exercise gave me a greater love and compassion for these beautiful people, each of whom is made in God's image. Every person on the planet, whether we like them or not, is made in God's image. They bear the imprint of God, and God loves them. The third point is that disciples make mistakes and learn from them. It would be a mistake to think that disciples don't make mistakes. We make mistakes. We're humans. And in the story, we see Martha making a mistake. Martha was distracted by, being, by, by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Martha lost her focus. She lost sight of the main thing in this story, and that was the person of Jesus. She saw the long to-do list. She saw the perceived failure of her sister Mary, and she became distracted and frustrated. But her concerns were not without merit, because culturally, Mary should have been beside her, helping her. Culture dictated that was Ma Mary's place, in the kitchen with Martha, helping her prepare the meal. But Jesus had an important lesson to teach Martha that day, an important lesson for us as well. Jesus was ushering in a new way of living and thinking and serving God. And who was allowed to sit at his feet as his disciple? Each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. Note that Martha was already a devoted follower of Jesus, 
She is the very one who made this statement in John 11. Yes, Lord, she told him, I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. In fact, when you look at the New Testament, this is an unusually clear picture of who Jesus was, extremely accurate. When many people were trying to figure out who is this guy, Martha got it. She was a devoted follower. But she simply got distracted in this situation. Like Martha, let's be honest, we get distracted. And distraction seems to be a major component of American culture. And now, world culture as, as well. We live in a very distracted world. The average person spends about three hours a day on social media. 60% of adults report they can't resist the urge to check their phones even while driving. 75% of teachers believe that students' abilities to concentrate are affected by social media use. While in North Africa, and I'd go into the bank, I was amused by the bank guards who were there at the front door, usually sitting in a chair, staring at their phone, oblivious to everything happening around them. And they were the security guards. So how did Jesus respond to Martha's distracted state of being? He responded to her request, tell her to come and help me with gentleness. Depending on the translation, he states, Martha, Martha, or my dear Martha. Remember, this was somebody that he knew and loved. He had her best interest at heart. So Jesus helped Martha regain her focus while upholding Mary's right to sit as a disciple at his feet. A good educated guess is that Martha responded in a positive manner because she did love Jesus so much and she was so dedicated to his ministry. Disciples make mistakes and learn from them. In fact, I would argue this morning, mistakes can be very good for us. They can be actually be very helpful if we own them and two, if we learn from them. And at this point right here, this is the point at which, like two roads diverge in the woods, you have those who make mistakes and learn from them. And they develop this habit of learning from their mistakes and they grow in emotional and spiritual maturity and they become amazing people of God. And you have others who make mistakes and for whatever reason, they choose not to learn from their mistakes and they continue on as a shallow disciple of Jesus. And it can be as simple as saying, I made a mistake. I'm going to learn from it. Mistakes keep us humble. Nobody is right all the time. If somebody is right all the time, it probably means they're wrong most of the time. We are humans together. We're not God. We don't need to pretend that we are. We make mistakes. Mistakes remind us that the goal is not always to be right, but to be a mature follower of Jesus. Those two are not the same things at all. Mature followers of Jesus need course correction as well. Mistakes allow us the opportunity to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. This is such an important habit in the life of a believer. Sometimes we just need to grow up not to be so stubborn, say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. To give forgiveness and to receive forgiveness is a powerful thing in our own lives and in the life of a family and community. And finally, mistakes create incredible opportunities for growth. That's what it is. We can wallow in it and get bitter and angry or just get really upset with ourselves and beat ourselves up. That leads nowhere, it leads nowhere. We own the mistake, we ask for forgiveness, and then we determine I'm going to become better through this. Much of my own emotional and spiritual growth has come after mistakes, sometimes the mistakes of others and sometimes my own. I encourage you this morning, allow Jesus to order your priorities. If Jesus is not the Lord of your priorities, I'm just gonna be really honest with you, you are going to find it very difficult to grow in your faith. Like, I wanna call myself a Christian, I want the benefits of the Christian life, 
but I kind of also want the benefit of doing things my own way. That's not how the life of discipleship works. It is about surrendering to Jesus. And when we do that, allowing Jesus to order our priorities, sometimes it stings for a short time. Or we can keep doing things our own way and it stings for a long time. If the urge to change is coming from God, I don't need to do that. Nobody else needs to do that. You can hear God's voice. You know when he's speaking to your heart. You know it. And then it's just on you to respond. And I'm asking you this morning, please do not allow culture to set your priorities for you. Culture is so loud and so noisy. And for me at times, so annoying. You are under no obligation to be a slave to the values of culture. You can listen to God's voice, which is often the still, small voice. Sometimes the loudest voice in the room just needs to go, unless it's God's. When Jesus corrects us, we don't need to make a big deal about it. We just need to respond positively. And Hebrews 12 has a great way of responding to God's correction in our lives. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. Don't give up. For the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. Let's not allow distractions to take our eyes off of what matters most, the person of Jesus Christ. We have the power to make difficult choices, to limit distractions, to set priorities, and to hear Jesus clearly. Jesus concludes this story this morning with a powerful comment. He says, there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. What is the one thing? What is the one thing that cannot be taken away? It is the with God life. It is the life of following Jesus, the abundant life that transcends all the noise and distraction that is all around us. So I've heard this illustration in my life. We're about to close now. And we, we sit down and we make a list of our priorities. It might go something like this. Oh, number one is God. Um, number two is my spouse. Three are my friends, four is my job, and that's okay. I see some value in that. I would argue there's a better illustration, and I'll, I'll show you, and we'll talk about it for a second. The circle is your life, and what is happening in your life changes as you get older, and circumstances come, and things are always changing. If we keep Jesus in the center, you're still going to have pain. You're still going to have disappointment. But things are going to go so much better for you because God's way is always better and he is for you. So whether you're married or not, whether you have little kids or empty nesters, we have the choice to keep Jesus in the center of our lives. And that's one of the key things in this story this morning. Our lives must literally revolve around Jesus and they can Let's recommit to the one thing this morning, not allowing culture to dictate to us what our priorities are, how we spend our money, how we have to live our lives. We surrender fully, completely, Monday through Saturday, including Sunday, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When we listen to Jesus and fully surrender to him, he brings so much clarity to our lives. We don't have to go through life seeing things unclearly. Wow, what a powerful message. I pray that you feel encouraged and that you feel empowered to be all that God created you to be. Can I just say thank you so much for watching Church Online with us. If you wouldn't mind, hit that subscribe button as well as the like button on this video. And if you wouldn't mind hitting that notification bell so that you get updated as we post more content throughout the week. Also, if you're local to the Kansas City metro area, I would love to personally invite you to join us for one of our services at our Lee Summit or our Warrensburg campus happening every single Sunday. Thank you again for being here. We love you so much and we'll see you on the next one.